having me, the organizers. Um, I also want to, this has been a wonderful opportunity. I'm really grateful um, to be here with you. And so I'm going to be continuing our conversation on the benefits of the arts and looking at how drawing um, can be beneficial for children in their everyday lives. And you may be asking, why am I focusing on drawing? Now, drawing is universal. We have evidence of drawing from our early ancestors, as you can see here in one of the cave paintings from France. Um, all cultures have some form of um, image making, whether that is representational or non-representational. And children engage in art from a very young age. And you may be thinking, well, adults, we're not engaging art but I bet in some of you taking notes that you have doodles and scribbles, um, so you may be engaging in art right now and not even know it. Um, drawing has many functions. It's a way to understand our visual world. Um, it's a way to seek beauty. Uh, it's a way to communicate, a way to express our emotions, uh, and a way to regulate our emotions. And artists have often talked about art as a form of therapy. Um, so here's a quote by Cezanne, paint their life salvation. Um, the writer Graham Greene wrote, writing is a form of therapy. Sometimes I wonder who, how all those who do not write, compose, or paint can manage to escape the madness, the melancholia, the panic fear which is inherent in the human situation. So in my work, I'm interested um, in how drawing improves mood. And that, this is work I do both with children and adults. Um, and specifically, how does it do it? Does it do it through allowing us to express negative thoughts and feelings, so having this cathartic release through our art making? Or does it allow us to kind of escape from our negative um, feelings? Um, so connecting to some of the work that Marie talked about earlier, having this mindfulness component where you're distracting yourself um, into an engaging activity. And artists have talked anecdotally both about art as a form of um, expression and as a way to escape. Um, so this is a quote by Picasso talking about his painting. Uh, painting is just another way of keeping a diary. So here he seems to suggest that um, painting is a way to express himself, to release, to reflect upon um, things that are bothering him. And I'll refer to this as the art to express view. And this is very consistent with um, the work by the, the uh, uh, um, mission statement of the American Art Therapy Association. So according to, on their website, art therapy is based on the belief that artistic self-expression helps people to resolve conflicts and problems, reduce stress, and achieve insight. Um, and there are many studies of patients receiving art therapy showing that there are benefits. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, many times art therapy is coupled with other types of talk therapy. Um, so it's hard to disentangle whether it's the art making itself or having that therapy um, coupled together. Of course, art therapy is much more than creating art. It's also a dialogue between patient um, and therapist that occurs over many um, sessions, typically. And so my work, I'm looking at, outside of this context, in a non-clinical sample of children and adults, can we use drawing to improve mood just in a single session in children's everyday um, lives? Um, a very different perspective by some other artists. So um, Renoir said, for me, painting is a way to forget life. Um, so here, Renoir is using his art making as a way to distract himself, to engage in activity that is pleasurable and that allows him to shift his attention away from maybe what is upsetting him or pain is painful. A similar statement was actually made by Van Gogh. It distracts me infinitely better than anything else. And this is very consistent with the um, benefits of distraction uh, in the emotion regulation literature. Um, but distraction is not only beneficial for artists. We do have some anecdotal evidence from uh, non-artists using drawing as a form of distraction. So this is a quote by Michelle Wee, um, one of the golf prodigies in the United States. So when I'm drawing, the rest of the world disappears. I think it just makes me really happy. It takes my mind off things. When I'm stressed out, it's like a positive outlet I can go to to relieve stress. It puts me in a better mood. Um, and you can see, I mean, it's not that she, you know, a lot of this is, it's, some of it's representational, her artwork, here's some examples, some of it's abstract. Um, you don't necessarily need to be talented in drawing in order to be able to use it as a way to um, improve your mood. Now, shifting to children, 
Um, emotion regulation is a very important component of children's um, development. And um, as adults, we have strategies that we've used and that we've learned to use um, that help us to regulate our emotions. Um, children are less um, able to kind of identify what strategies they need to use, and they definitely need some help in scaffolding and what strategies are, are best and what to use in particular situations. And what's been shown when um, the study here looked at the Skinner and Zimmer Gumbeck, um, looked at what strategies are children using, and they find overwhelmingly children are using distraction um, as a form of emotion regulation. Um, the most common being behavioral distraction, so engaging in activities um, that are fun, um, or cognitive distraction, and is that, that's thinking about something that's fun or enjoyable. Um, so given that children really use distraction, it seems that drawing would be, um, it's something that children engage in from a very young age. It seems like it would be an activity that would be helpful and that would improve their mood. So there are many emotion regulation strategies. I have selected two that I think particularly um, relevant to drawing and that have been cited um, anecdotally by um, professional artists. So the first is distraction. Um, and so that is turning away or shifting away from our negative thoughts and feelings, engaging in activity, and then venting, which is using the art to express our negative thoughts and feelings. And throughout the talk, I'll be referring venting as expressing, not venting, just to be clear. So I'm going to ask um, three questions that I have some studies to show you that'll answer these questions. The first is, does drawing improve mood in children? Um, the second sort of answers the first, but how does drawing improve mood in children? So I'm going to look at under what kind of circumstances or what types of drawings um, seem more helpful to children than others. And then finally, um, what do children draw spontaneously what they, when they're upset? Um, so the first two um, questions I've you know, given children instructions on what to draw, and the third one I wanted to look at, well, what do children actually draw spontaneously? What kind of images are they creating? So I just want to go over just quickly the experimental design of my studies. It's the same for all of the um, experiments I'll be showing you. So we have some type of sad mood induction. So I am making children think of something that's upsetting or disappointing. Um, this is an example of what we um, ask children to do. Um, I think of a time when you wanted something really good to happen to you and you didn't, and you felt really upset and disappointed. I want you to close your eyes and think about how you're feeling when it didn't happen. And so we have children um, cover their eyes and think about this for a minute, and then we have them report how they're feeling. So after the mood induction, in this first study, we randomly assigned them to use drawing as a form of distraction or as a way to express themselves. And I'll show you a couple examples in a moment of what that looks like. And we measure mood before and after the mood induction. So this mood time one gives us kind of a baseline measure how are children when they're coming into the, the study. After the mood induction let us, lets us know, you know, did children's mood go down after thinking of something sad? And then we finally ask them about their mood at the very end of the study. And that allows us to determine whether there are differences between the two conditions. Um, this is our mood rating. So it's just a, a, basically a pain scale that has been adapted to um, be mood rating. So children are presented with these five faces and asked to rate how they're feeling from very happy to very sad. And I'm working with children um, between the ages of six and 12. So we have them broken up into younger children, six to eight, and older children, 10 to 12. And these are selected for a particular reason. So I'm testing two um, competing hypotheses. The first is that it's possible that the younger children are more absorbed in the act of drawing. So what's been shown is that young children um, are very engaged when they're given the opportunity to draw. They're not as critical in evaluating their drawings as older children are. So it's possible that these children um, would have the greatest mood benefit. On the other hand, um, older children, those 10 to 12 year olds, um, they play an active, more active role in regulating their emotions. So it's possible they rely less on parental support than the younger children, and it's possible that having this opportunity to engage in drawing um, may be more beneficial for them. Okay, so does drawing improve mood in children? So these were studies that I conducted in Boston, in two children's museums, um, with the milk can is the Boston Children's Museum, and then this one over here is the Museum of Science. And in terms of our activity, so in the express condition, um, we asked children to draw the event that they thought of. 
Now, in the adult studies, we ask adults to think of a very sad experience, and we ask them to express their thoughts and feelings. That seemed difficult for a six-year-old to kind of figure out how to do, so we had them focus on the event that they thought of. And then in the distract condition, we had them draw a house, which was intended to be a neutral object. And so I'm going to give you some examples of drawings. So this is one in the drawing to express condition. And so this little girl here um, is the, supposed to be the person who drew this, and she was unable to go on a play date with a friend. And so you can see she has a frowny face here. And then this is an example of the distract condition. So children are given paper and markers, and they're actually only given five, we give them five minutes um, to draw. Um, and so this is an example in, of the, our house. Okay, so I do have some graphs, but you'll see a couple times. So we're looking at how much does mood change from before to after drawing. And so we have our younger children and our older children. And so what we find is that the distract is in red. We find the distract condition has greater move improvement than the express condition. And this is more so for younger than for older children. Um, so we are finding age effects here. Now in our, um, the second question, I wanted to look, well, how does drawing improve mood? Um, are there certain conditions or that would enhance the drawing experience? Um, so one question I wanted to look at is, what about copying? Do children have to create their own image um, to, see, to have the benefits, or could they copy an image? So in this study, the express and the distract condition are identical. Um, but we also introduced a copy condition where children were given um, simple line drawings of common objects. So here we have a teapot, we also had a toaster oven, we had a vacuum cleaner that were just made up of like kind of simple lines. And children were again given markers and they were asked to copy uh, the drawing. And what we find is that um, replicating our previous study, that the distract condition did improve mood more than the express condition. But we also find that it, the distract condition proved more than the copy condition. And again, these results were stronger for younger than for older children. So this suggests that having the opportunity to create your own drawing, even when you have directions that you're creating a specific object, is more beneficial than copying something. So having some of that freedom, and even though we told you to draw a house, children have freedom of what that house looked like, how many windows, what color. Um, we also wanted to look at, does drawing improve mood because it leads to higher lace, uh, rates of absorption? So children are more absorbed in the act of drawing. And so um, we had our own measures, so there's some work showing that when we engage in activities that are challenging, but also have some skill involved, we have states of flow. So our absorption question was um, meant to assess kind of flow, um, but for children. So in this question, we asked um, to measure absorption while we, after children finished their drawing, we asked them this question. While you're drawing, did you forget about the time you couldn't go on a play date with a friend, or you couldn't stop thinking about going on that play date with a friend when you couldn't go? So we kind of named the event, and we asked children whether it's really true or sort of true. And what we find, first we replicate distraction improves mood more than expression. But we also find that distraction, um, those in the distraction have greater absorption. So they're more absorbed in the activity than the express group, which I think makes sense. Um, but contrary to what we would have thought, we do find this kind of trend where older children have a little more absorption than the younger children. So they do seem more absorbed in the act of drawing, which is contrary to some other previous work. We also looked at enjoyment, and we do find that um, the distract condition has greater enjoyment than the express condition, no age differences. Um, but I should note that this is I really enjoyed it, and this is I enjoyed it. So the children really, I mean, all of them seem to enjoy it, whether they were getting the distract or the express condition, so having the opportunity to enjoy, um, draw they enjoyed. It's just that the distract condition was a little bit higher um, than the express condition. We've also looked at you know, creating an imaginary world. So some work has shown that when children um, engage in imaginary play or they have an imaginary companion, that's beneficial for their emotional well-being. So we're interested in whether um, creating imaginary um, drawing would be more beneficial than creating like a realistic drawing. And so these are, this is work that was done at the Brooklyn Children's Museum um, in New York City, as well as the Met um, in Manhattan. And so we had um, a real condition. So this is a 
just in case you can't tell, a dog chasing um, a robber here. And then we have a structurally similar um, picture. This is a dragon chasing a witch, right? So you can see these children, are, you know, it's not like they're extremely gifted. They're age-typical drawings, um, which I find adorable, but yeah. Um, and then we had our express condition. And so what we find is that it doesn't matter whether um, the content is real or imaginary. It's that it's distracting that seems to be um, making the difference. And in both cases, the real and imagined had greater mood improvement than the express condition. Um, and again, we're finding more benefits for younger than for older uh, children. OK, so finally, we wanted to look at what do children draw spontaneously if we give them no um, kind of prompt of what to draw. So this study followed a very similar design. Um, after the mood induction, we just asked children to draw whatever they'd like. And we asked them draw ex uh, questions about their drawing experience. You know, why did you draw this? What were you thinking about while drawing? Um, so we could just look at and whether, how is that related to the content. Um, and what we find is children um, draw things that they enjoy doing. So this is a child, um, when we asked what he drew, he said, I really like, um, and why he drew it, he said, I really like roller coasters. Um, we also find that drawing seems to be re related to self-efficacy. So children are drawing things that they are good at. So this child reported, I like, you know, I'm good at drawing flowers and trees. And then still some other children draw things that are important to them. So this child drew, um, it says a happy day, and it's mom, dad, sister, their two sisters, and their mom and dad. So they drew their family. Um, and what we find, so this is a little bit different, but I, what, so time one is before engaging in the study, what we find is that mood does go down with the mood induction, um, but that there is, you know, when even they're drawing things spontaneously, their mood does improve. Um, and we find, again, find it stronger for younger, the younger children in purple. So we find they have greater mood improvement than the older children. Um, we looked at what strategy children were using. So we coded, you know, what were children thinking about in their mood induction and what did they draw and how were they related. And overwhelmingly, we find that children use drawing as a form of distraction, which I think makes sense given some of the work that's looked at children's emotion regulation abilities. Very few use it as a form of expression. Um, we looked at the content of children's drawing. So coding, you know, what they reported that they drew and we find there is a difference by age group. So younger children tend to draw things that they enjoy, um, activities they enjoy. And older children um, tend to draw things that they observe in their world. You know, I was walking to the museum and I passed some flowers or I saw this, um, you know, picture of something. So they tend to things, draw things in their, in, their, um, in their world that they have observed. And th finally, we asked children their thoughts while drawing. So what were you thinking about? Kind of, we asked them at the end to reflect back. What were you thinking about while drawing? And we find um, half of them are focused on their drawings. So a seven-year-old said the colors I was using. Um, a 10-year-old reported what to add to the drawing. We find an additional 25% or 26% are focused on other distracting things that are unrelated to their drawing. So an eight-year-old was focused on animals. Um, an 11-year-old being outside with my friends. So, we are fo um, so their thoughts are consistent with them using drawing as a form of distraction. So in conclusion, um, some of this work is showing that drawing is effective, um, even a single ses session of drawing, in improving mood. Um, and it seems when creating your own image is more important than copying an image for children. So giving the, having that ability to um, create your own uh, object or drawing, um, there seems to be related to absorption. So, and we also did find that children's mood improvement was related to how absorbed they were in the activity, so there was a, a correlation there. Um, we find right now that it, it doesn't matter whether you're creating something imaginary versus non-imaginary, um, and that there are benefits just from asking children to draw. So drawing something spontaneously, and, but there are different differences in what children are drawing based on their age, with younger children drawing things they enjoy, um, and older children um, drawing things that they observe in their world. Okay, so I just wanna thank um, my lab at Brooklyn College, the Arts and Development Lab, and then all the places that were so wonderful opening their doors to allow me to work with their children. So thank you.
have a timer? Could I potentially also? Oh, it's fine. I'm going to try it. Would it start if I do? Hmm. This doesn't do anything if I click. Oh, there it is. Ooh, then it went too far. And now it's back again. Let's see. Um, perfect. So what we heard a lot about is the benefits of making art yourself. And what I'm trying to convince you of in this talk is the benefits of just looking at art. The benefit of just being the audience, um, not making something yourself actively, but actively engaging um, with an artwork. So um, what I want to start with is an artwork. Um, so sadly, I couldn't find a, a high enough quality uh, of video to show you, but um, this artwork by Rinneke Dijkstra is an artwork I really like. It's a video installation where you see British, um, British school children, and they're looking at the Picasso I showed you before. So they're looking at this, this artwork, um, and they're trying to understand what is going on. And in the video, what you see is these kids looking, and they come up with all of these ideas, what might be happening in this artwork. So you see some of these hairs like, oh, um, maybe she's crying because she did something wrong. Or I feel like something bad is going to happen to her. Um, really funny, my favorite is at one point when so someone says, maybe she's crying because she's happy because someone bought her sports car. And this is like the really funny thing the kids come up with. And I would never think about it if I saw this artwork. Uh, you know, at one point a kid just said, or maybe she's a ghost. Um, so if you get a chance to see this artwork, I really recommend it. Um, but this is, I also think, a really good um, view of what actually happens when we go to the museum and we look at an artwork, we also look at this Picasso and think, what is going on? Like, what is this woman doing? Why is she crying? What's, you try to understand it. Um, so some of my talk will overlap a bit with what Pablo said yesterday, because I think we have a similar idea of that looking at an artwork is a conversation between you and the artwork. Um, so it's gonna be an emotions, which I think we all think is very important. And of course, in this artwork comes across a lot because the woman in the art is crying. Um, but also I have a, is coming up in basically every single model we have scientifically about art. So there's emotion here in the later at all model. There's emotion in Chatterjee and Furtanian, in a recent Pulaski et al. model, in the model that Pablo showed you yesterday that summarizes some of these models. So emotion is a big, big thing that we think is happening. But if you think about emotion um, in everyday life, so if you think not about looking at an artwork or engaging with art, but, but engaging with people, what happens very often is that, that we share emotions. Um, and we cry together, we're surprised together, and we're happy together. This is the, you know, the nice part where we're drinking together, or our football team wins, and everything is great, and we share all of these emotions. And we were thinking, could this happen with art? If we think of engaging with art as having a conversation with someone, maybe we're also having this sharing emotion experience when we're looking at art. Um, and this is the basis of, of the first study. So we have the artist who, it's quite common, they express something. They express a feeling, an emotion, something that maybe is not so easy to say um, in words, but that you can express through art. Um, but this is kind of a one-way street, right? The artist is expressing something, the viewer just receives the message. And what we're thinking about is that if you see um, it as emotion sharing or as some kind of interaction, then it's not just the artist communicating something to the viewer, but also the viewer that has some kind of active involvement with the artist through, through the artwork. Um, so in this study, what we did is that we teamed up with Florida State, um, the art program there, so with three of their MFA students make art um, they were all installation artists, so they all made um, different installations. Um, and after they made the art, we asked them, how do you feel? So we had a long list of emotions, and they just rated how much they felt these emotions. And then we also said, which emotions do you want the audience to feel? What do you want the people who look at your art to feel? And then in the second step, we had people actually look at the artworks and ask them the same things. 
So we asked them, what do you feel looking at the artwork? And also, what do you think that the artist wanted you to feel? Um, and what we found was, very interestingly, is that artists and viewers spontaneously shared emotions. So even emotions that the artist didn't necessarily wanted to express through their art or wanted to communicate. Um, it was just, this is how the artist felt, and actually the viewer felt quite similar looking at it. Um, and we also found that people who viewed the art felt the emotions that the artist wanted them to feel more than the other emotions. So as you can see, it didn't work in it. So it worked really well for artwork one and artwork two, not so much for artwork three. Um, so potentially there is some kind of skill involved to make the viewer feel uh, what you want them to feel, and it doesn't always work, but it tends to work quite well. Um, so this was very interesting to us um, because of course, you know, if you make some artwork, you might want the viewer to feel all of these things and do all of these things, but is it really happening? And this is kind of indicating that, yes, it is. Artists are quite effective in m making their methods come across just by looking at their artwork. Also, this is a bit of a big deal. Um, so the D comes from signal detection theory, which I wouldn't go into, but it's basically a measure of how good people are guessing um, and picking up signals that they are. Um, so people are actually really good at guessing which emotions the artist wanted to portray. So this is also quite interesting. So even in the artwork, so artwork three, they didn't really feel what, what the artist wanted them to feel, but they were still pretty good at guessing what the artist wanted them to feel. They just didn't feel it, um, but they could pick up on it. And this is also for me quite interesting because if you look at an artwork and you think like, what is the artist thinking, like what, what is he trying to make me feel or what's she trying to express? I mean, normally if I come to some kind of guess, I don't necessarily feel like, I, yeah, I came up with the right answer, but it seems that actually probably I did because people tend to be quite good. So this is quite positive for me looking at art. Um, so we try to also do this in a bit higher quality. So these were students' works. And, in Florida, but we also did it at the Biennale in Venice. Um, so here, of course, we can <laughs> work with the artists also because we came in a bit late, so everything was already planned. Um, but the curator of the Italian pavilion, which you see right here, um, brought out a pretty extensive catalog. Um, so what they did is they had a really specific idea what they wanted for the pavilion, and then as the artist came, make an artwork that does this, um, and the artist tried. Uh, to do that. So we basically went from the catalog to guess what the intention of the, the artist was for each artwork. So it looked like this if you see it schematically. So you would enter here and that's artwork one, which looked like this. Um, so it was pretty creepy. Uh, also it was really dark in the pavilion. Um, so basically actually these bodies were produced here. Then they were dried here in like weird bubbles and then they were hung up uh, here on the wall, which you can see, can see in the image. Um, then the second room, which you can see here, there was light on the on the floor, and then there was a seating area because there was a big screen, so it was a video installation, and it looked um, like this. It was a tarot game, or it was young kids playing tarot cards and coming up with interpretations, and that's what you saw. And then after you saw that, you could go here, um, underneath a big installation, as you can see here, you go up a few steps and then you're confronted with this. It's not a really good image, it was really hard to make a good image um, because it was really dark. So what it was, it was a huge water basin and it reflected the structure of the ceiling. So here it's already quite hard to see. So I think the horizon is somewhere here. I'm not even quite sure in this picture um, because it mirror reflected. So um, it was quite intense. So what we got from the thing is that um, the creepy bodies were supposed to have fear, <laughs> which, you know, was obvious because it was creepy. Uh, <laughs> mysticism, but also reference. Um, in the video where the kids reflected on themselves, you were supposed to feel empowered or self-aware, unease. And in the, the last one, calm, potentially melancholy, and also vertical because it was such a kind of weird experience. You didn't really know what the space was doing what up or down was. Um, so this was what we got from the, from the catalog that people so we were supposed to be feeling. And we actually found very similar results. So again, we found that 
people felt the emotions that the artists intended more than the emotions they didn't. Interestingly, we again found that it worked really well for Artwork 1, not so well for Artwork 2, and really well again for Artwork 3. So even on a more professional level, it seems to be not that easy to make um, people um, feel something. Um, and again, people were really good at, at guessing what, what the artist wanted to say. So from this, we can know that engaging with art is an emotional experience. And it's quite a complex emotional experience. We can engage with art as if we are engaging with another human, even though there's no human there in a way. There's just traces of what someone else created. But can art also um, affect our general emotional lives? Can, us make, can it make us more empathic? Can it make us more pro-social or any of these kinds of of things that is more in our normal life that it happens when we're not engaging with art. Um, so this has been proposed by artists and scientists alike. For example, Olafur Eliasson, he said, the arts have an incredible potential for expanding interconnectedness, for reaching people, for touching them, and increasing empathy and compassion in the world. So a really interesting study that just came out this year um, by Xu, Conrad, and Goldstein, um, took a representative sample of Americans. So they had four big surveys, um, national surveys that were done um, over a time span with different representative samples of Americans that included some questions about arts activities and also pro-sociality. And they tried to also look at this question, can it make us more pro-social? And what they found is, yes, viewing art can make you more pro-social. Um, which you can see in red here. Um, also, what for me was very interesting that it was even more so than making art. So the line above that is arts creation and they also did a different score below. So actually what they found is that just looking at art, just being the audience, actually made people more pro-social than making the art. Um, and very interesting, they found the same pattern even six years later. So it's not just engaging with art at time point one, it's one very short-term effect that makes you more pro-social for a little while, but it also predicts how pro-social you are six years later. And again, here, as you can see in red, it is mainly the being the audience, just consuming the art that created this pro-sociality uh, effect rather than um, making art or playing an instrument. There was also some little effect of, of making art. Um, actually, there were some negative effects of making art. Um, but in general, it was especially the consuming that made people more post-social. Um, so we wanted to also delve into this topic in a very recent study we did just this summer uh, in the Dome Museum in, in Vienna. So the Dome Museum is a very interesting museum because um, it's right next to Stephen's Dome, our big cathedral in the middle of the city, and it houses their collection. So it has a lot of these very typical um, Christian artworks. But very interestingly, it also has the Otomawa um, collection. And Otomawa is a really interesting person because he was, on one hand, um, the priest of the cathedral, and on the other hand, he started the biggest or the most influential contemporary art gallery in Vienna in the 50s. Um, so they have this really interesting mix with having this really classical collection and then having this really contemporary um, collection. And they just renovated. And in their new exhibition scheme, they always try to kind of combine these two collections with overarching themes. Um, so in the exhibition that we worked with, it was called Zeig mir deine Wunde, or um, Show me your wound. As you can see here, it can be very literally like a wound in a foot. Um, but it could also be Wounds of the Soul. So there's this video by Ekon Utzken, Wonderland, um, where this little boy, basically just by use of his body and use of science, um, talks about, or talks, about his experience in war. Um, so it was quite a heavy exhibition, so it was all about vulnerability, where are you wounded, what hurts you, either physically or metaphorically. And then it used, so this is mainly contemporary art, but there were also artworks like this in. So the very classical kind of Christian uh, art um, with this martyrdom. So what we did here is 
Again, the same paradigm as before, but here we worked with the curators. So not so much with the artist, but what, what did the curator want the, the people to feel? Um, because an artwork can mean one thing in one exhibition, but potentially have a different interpretation in another exhibition. Um, because as we know, artworks tend to be quite complex, and if a curator makes an exhibition, they're thinking about an overarching theme, what brings all of these artworks together, what do I want to say with this combination of artworks? So we also were very interested in seeing, like, maybe does this combination also work, right? It's not just what did the artist wanted to say and this one piece on its own, but could it also work as this kind of overarching story? And can a curator, just by pulling some pieces together, also influence uh, what people feel when they look at art? And then we wanted to look at this um, pro-sociality thing. So actually we did two studies. We did a very classic pre- and post-design, which is very similar to some of the things I showed you before. So we um, literally took people off of the street, uh, gave them a questionnaire, threw them kind of in the exhibition, gave them another questionnaire and see if things changed from before they looked at the art to after they looked at the art. Um, but we also had a second group where we used experience sampling. Um, so this was very much getting into the everyday life. So if you don't know experience sampling, basically what it does, you have an app on your phone it buzzes you sometimes, and then you have to fill out a questionnaire. In our case, we had people fill out a questionnaire one time a day, and they reported just in their daily lives, how do you feel today, um, some pro-social actions they may have done that day, did you help someone today, these kind of questions. And they did this for a week, then they got five days in which they could visit the museum whenever was convenient to them, um, and then they did it for a week after looking at the art. And our idea was, this is quite interesting because maybe art doesn't just has this effect, like you look at the art and something happens and then it's gone again. But maybe there is something that you look at the art and maybe it helps you through your normal life when you're not looking at the art after. I have to say we just collected this data in July. Um, so sadly, um, I cannot tell you the results of the experience sampling because we haven't analyzed it yet. So Catherine, who's here, um, is responsible for that, but we didn't get it. Um, this I analyzed very quickly last week, so I have some results uh, on that, but they're very preliminary um, results because I couldn't analyze everything that we did. So what we found is again that people felt emotions that the curator attended more than things they didn't attend. So it seems to not be working just on the level of the artist, but also the curator can make people feel things. And again, people were quite good at um, guessing what the curator wanted to say, even if they didn't feel it. Also, interestingly, what we saw is that viewing the exhibition actually made people less xenophobic, um, but not necessarily more emphatic or more pro-social. I have to say, the things that I looked at now were self report so people didn't see themselves as more emphatic or pro-social after um, they looked at the art. We also had some behavioral tasks. So there was one task where people had to divide money between them and a fictional other person, um, which is in a way, if I give the other people more money, that's more pro-social of me. I haven't gotten to analyze that because I just did it this summer. Um, but that's what we have for now. But this is a line of research that we plan to do in the future, especially because, and this is going to be a little promo section, um, a colleague of mine just got a um, Horizon 2020 grant, so it's spearheaded by my colleague Matthew Blaski, who I did a lot of work with that I just presented to you um, now, and the grant is from the EU, and it's all about societal transformations through the arts. So can art make us more pro-social? Can it help with social integration? Can it do all of these um, things? So we're also working with a lot of other people. Um, for example, also art schools like Weizenstee in Berlin is very interesting. Um, they each year have a class of students that were artists in their home country, immigrated to Germany, and now start art school. Um, um, there, Matthew told me that we're hiring people, so if you're interested in doing a PhD or a postdoc on this topic, I should tell you to reach out or look around. It will start about February next year. And then I want to thank you for your attention and of course, acknowledge everyone else. <laughs> Should we? I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's your name. Bueno, pues vamos a ver. Okay.
if distraction improves the mood of a child more than expression, would it be as useful to use other techniques to, for example, sports, music, games? Would it have the same impact? Is distra I just want to make sure I get the question. So in distraction with other activities. Uh, so I haven't looked at that with children. I have looked at it with adults, um, looking at other, in, in, for example, games and other activities, um, writing as well. And I found that drawing is actually more beneficial um, when used as a form of distraction than other non-drawing distraction tasks. Um, but I don't necessarily know whether that's true for children. Um, but I think it's important that they do something that they enjoy um, and that, so that could be, um, you know, playing games or, or, or sports that could also be beneficial. Thank you. Vamos allá. Um... The next one. Yeah, first question. Even though to get to know the artist's emotion when making the work of art, it closes you to the work. There are some artists that do not want to add this information about their artworks so that the audience may activate their own emotions. What do you think? Yeah, exactly. So um, this is something that, of course, not always the artist wants to necessarily make people feel things. There is also especially conceptual art that is way more on a, on a thinking level. Um, what I found very interesting is that when we actually could ask the artist, how did you feel when making it, that these feelings were still coming across. So this, there was a spontaneous emotion sharing, what also happens if you're with people and they're laughing, so you laugh, and, and this mm -hmm. thing was also happening with the arts, even though, so even emotions that the artist didn't necessarily want to get across, got across, and I think this could potentially also happen um, with artworks where people don't necessarily want to say something, but still you, you just inherently pick up on it. Um, but there could also be artworks that just don't feel anything. So quite funny, in, in, in the two studies we did, we had three artworks, and it was basically working in two of the cases. And mm -hmm. in one of the cases, it was not. Um, with the time pavilion, we don't know if, <laughs> if the artist wanted to make people feel something. In the other one, that was kind of the assignment. Um, so and I, there's other works of art, like minimalism or so, that might not have this emotional experience. This question is for Jennifer. Distraction improves negative emotional moods or only moves them around without managing them? And there's another related question. Drawing as a distraction tool, is it different from other activities as playing, for example, with a smartphone, cooking, the sports? Well, I think you had already responded to the second one. Let us go. Interesting question, though. So are we just moving? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's a very interesting um, potential avenue for future research is to look at, you know, maybe over time, is it helping them uh, learn strategies to regulate their emotions? I don't know the answer, but I thank that person for a very um, interesting research question to explore. Yes. <laughs> Does anybody have an answer to this question? Raise your hand. How can we explain that people might be more pro-social for looking at art more than producing art? And in what conditions this study took place and how did you measure the results? The study, uh, so the study that I didn't talk about the design, the pro-sociality study by, by Sue Conrath and Goldstein, that was just big national survey. So it was a really long questionnaire. So they, um, so it was four different ones where they sampled like 300 people per survey about, and they asked them about a lot of things. Um, these others just picked these surveys because they also included arts questions. Um, so they asked them about pro-sociality behaviors, but also like a lot of other things. So that's kind of, the, I guess that people just get the survey sent at home and they do it because they also do it over a long time. This is why they can also look at the effects for six years later. The other question is something that people immediately asked me in the beginning, where it's like, how can it be that looking at art makes you more pro-social than making art? And for me, actually, this makes a lot of sense, but I understand that for a lot of people it doesn't. So I would explain it in this way, that when you're making art, what you're doing is um, looking inside. 
You're reflecting on yourself, your own emotions, and that's what you're focused on. When you're looking at art, you're focused outside. Mm -hmm. You're thinking about what is the other person thinking? What is the other person doing? What the other person wants to do? And so I think looking at art is a way more social process than making art. Making art is a lot more individual, a lot more self-focused. And I think this is probably why you find strong effects on pro-sociality pro for the looking, because the looking is a social activity, and the making is, can be. Of course, you can make art with other people. We did yesterday, it was really fun. Um, so it can be a social activity, but it doesn't have to be. Well, the looking is inherently a, a social component, and mm -hmm. this is why I think that's the one that's helping. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Jennifer. Jennifer, don't you think it's contradictory that we talk about creativity in arts and then in the schools we all learn to draw the same since we're very small, killing creative creativity of all of us and just uh, awarding copies instead of creation? I mean, that's an excellent question, too, because you find that, you know, very young children are very creative and they, you know, they draw purple skies and green suns. And then, you know, when we shift to about eight years, children really of age are really, um, they want to get it right. And we have a focus on, I need to draw it perfectly as it is represented in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and you could say, you know, it is stifling creativity besides even just removing the arts from you know, our schools where, you know, children have this focus on it has to be right, I have, you know, and that's also children becoming more self-critical and, you know, maybe even stop drawing. So, yes, it's not necessarily a good thing, but maybe encouraging children to be creative and to draw and to use any color they would like that they don't necessarily have to represent, um, you know, representational things, maybe drawing things that are abstractly or thinking things from a different angle might be, a, you know, a good tool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I would actually tack on them that. Yeah. Because what we saw in a lot of... Um, other talks is that creativity is not just original, but it's also task appropriate. And for it to be task appropriate, you need to know what happens. The sky is blue, the sun is yellow, and then, you know, it has to fit. So it's in a way, they're maybe losing some of their originality, mm. but they're improving in the other part of the creativity. Mm. And this is, if you focus on one, you might lose the other, but you kind of need both, potentially. Mm. Do we have time for one more question? Yes. Hi, Eva. You said that observing and consuming art fosters emotional intelligence and to be social as much as doing art yourself. How can we foster our creativity going to exhibitions? How can we foster or promote our own creativity? Just in a way, I, I, I would go back to the very first artwork that I showed you. Because this is, in a way, for me, the, the kids come up with such creative things. Mm -hmm. You know, the sports car, I would never think about that looking at this Picasso. And I do think this is, in a way, trying to interpret art and trying to guess what the people are saying or, or, or engaging with the artwork is a kind of creative thing. Um, because it's also not just thinking about what do they want to say, but also what does this mean to me? And what does it remind me of? And I, you know, this woman is crying, I cried before. And so I think it could be a quite creative thing. And then especially nowadays when you, I mean, it's not that recent, um, but with participatory artworks or other things where you really have to engage in things, um, going to the museum can actually be a super creative experience because, I mean, I don't play any musical instruments and yesterday we had to record a song. I cannot even read notes, but it was really fun to be, you know, that just to do something random, something creative, I mean, it didn't sound good, but it was still nice. And it felt really creative and it felt really energized. And this can also happen when you look at other um, artworks, especially in the museum, I think, nowadays. So theater and, and, and stuff can also sometimes be interactive. Um, but I always think the museum or visual art, visual art is a bit more free in a way because you can decide to leave or not leave. You can decide where you go. And this is, I mean, there's some, some theater plays, of course, that work like that. But um, performance art tends to be more like you sit there for the time that it takes and that's what you do. And the last question, would it, it be possible that the drawing model based on destruction is more beneficial for children because it doesn't require a specific skill? Is this related to having skills or not for drawing? Or? Related to having skills. So I've done, uh, most of my work has actually been with adults. 
Um, and, um, and I have found that it, it is overwhelmingly beneficial for adults um, using it as a form of distraction um, for a single session and actually over time. So I've shown over several days and a month um, that using drawing as a kind of way to feel better about your everyday life is, um, is beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you don't, don't, you don't need to be talented, you all can draw and doodle and, and feel better. <laughs> Muy bien, si alguien más quiere hacer alguna pregunta. If you have any other question, we have a couple of minutes. If it's not in the application, okay, thank you very much for your attention.